The Sacred Living Podcast is brought to you by Tropiki, a Jamaican-made self-care and wellness brand which includes natural handmade soaps, hair and scalp restoration products, womb care products, and healing herbal blends. Sacred Living is the embodiment of all the values that we seek. At this point in my life, what is sacred to me is my relationships. A sacred living is simple living. Sacred living is just showing up always as your authentic self. The way I view sacred living is, is living in harmony with, you know, the sacral energy. To live a sacred life means to be fully aligned and connected with the divine self. What is up for, you know? Unless it be a night and everything. That is how I live in. I am Tefara, the host of the Sacred Living Podcast, where we discuss everything that involves living a purposeful, connected, and balanced life. For the first season, the focus is self, as proper connection with our outer world is impossible without truly connecting to our inner world. I really went back and forth in my mind a lot about what topic to start with. Do I start with shadow work? A lot of shadow work is in the mind. Do I start with purification? Purification needs a lot of mental work as well. So I think it's essential that we start with mental discipline, mind work. So in tonight's episode, we're exploring the power of thought and how we control it with one of my favorite books, if not my favorite book, The Master Key by L.W. DeLawrence. This book will give you all the tools that will help you to be able to change your world. This book helped me to transform my own life. The Master Key helped me out of certain mindsets, helped me out of certain situations and circumstances. In many ways, this book changed my life. And I've always recommended it to everyone that I know. I've mentioned it several times on my YouTube channel. I've mentioned it on my social media pages as well. If you know me, you know that this is one of my favorite books. And so I'm so happy to share it with you today in this way, as I've longed to do. So this is actually a dream of mine that I'm fulfilling. So I hope that you receive it. A quick shout out to my book supplier, iNation Books and Necessities. He's the one who I got the master key from the first time. I remember the day I got it. I remember what the weather was like. I remember what our conversations were on that particular day. It's just that type of book. Some people have categorized the book as esoteric, but to me, it's just a very detailed self-help book. There is nothing really esoteric about it. It's a book about how to master willpower, your own mind, how to focus, how to concentrate, how to release certain thoughts, how to recall, how to visualize. Maybe some people might see that as esoteric, but I don't. I think that's just living. He is an occultist, that's for sure. You know, a lot of his work is about the occult. A lot of his work is about magic. Uh, in fact, one of his very popular books is called the Obia Bible. It was originally called the Great Book of Magical Art, Hindu, Magic, and East Indian Occultism. In the Obia tradition, he is well known. A lot of his work, maybe all of his work, is banned in Jamaica. If you go on Jamaica Customs website and look on look for prohibited products, you will see L.W. DeLorean's. That's just how powerful his work is that people used it in, in Obia. And so it was banned here. Anyway, those are stories for other days. We can talk about Obia in another episode. So this particular book, as I said, to me, it's really just a self-help book. It's about self-work. First, what you do 
with your mental power after that is a whole other conversation. Many people say that they struggle to read the master key. But interestingly, from what I've observed, it takes mental discipline to read a book about mental discipline. And that's exactly the case with the master key. It's not an easy read. The language is like old English and the information can be overwhelming. I remember reading a page several times before it came to me. Not just one page. There are quite a few pages I read several times before I actually got that aha moment. And I think DeLawrence wrote the book in a way that reading the book becomes a practice of mental discipline for the reader. You know, repetition is definitely a tool for a lot of the mind work that you will do as a student of mental discipline. And so you will find yourself reading some things over and over again. Get used to that because that is mind training. Thought or manner of thinking and self-control or mental discipline are important factors in life's achievements. On these depend our power of concentration and the mental equilibrium that must be maintained by those who wish to advance. It lies within the earnest student to create a world of thought wherein he may weather with calm fortitude the storms of mental life. For disappointment and sorrow pass no one by, and suffering is the loom in which character is made. Mind can be so powerful a defensive arm in the battle of earthly existence that in behalf of his interests and welfare, the student should learn to measure its force, understand its almost limitless power, and educate himself to employ it judiciously. The student must learn to appreciate at its true value this force, given to him that he may be able to meet and conquer not only exterior difficulties, but even greater and more subtle enemies within. So that was two paragraphs from the first chapter, the introduction. I'm just going to read you like little parts of it that you can take away and think about whether or not you want to invest in this book and invest in yourself in this type of way. So chapter one is essentially about the law of mentalism. You know, that's one of the seven universal laws. All is mind. So if you learn how to cultivate certain mental habits, you can totally control your reality. Because thoughts need direction as thoughts control your world. If you don't give direction to your thoughts, it will be influenced by any and everything. So you have to increase boundaries. You have to create boundaries. And it is good to be able to do it at will. The master key has six parts and 37 chapters. So in part one, we pass the introduction. And now in part one, you are introduced to certain ideas, certain concepts of mental discipline. It speaks to mental habits good and bad habits it speaks of self-reliance self-control and that's about knowing what you want the will you have for yourself independent of others what are your interests or desires part one also introduces you to concentration and concentration is about focus take our eyes for example our eyes are like lenses. Our lenses are like our eyes. We can be in a room and we can have a panoramic view of the entire room. But if we want, we can focus on one thing. We can focus on one particular thing and give a description to it, very detailed description about this particular thing because we have zoomed in on it. It's a similar thing with mind control. You have all these thoughts, you have all these ideas are there, but you just zoom in on this one thing and concentrate on it. Part one also speaks of the metaphysics behind concentration. And metaphysics has to do with the unseen but felt powers behind everything.
there is, in fact, a mental chemistry akin to physical. Thus, the life wave which seeks further expression by the coming into contact with the mental attributes of man is compelled to wait till invited to enter. That is why evolution seems so slow in the cases of some people. They do not recognize that outside themselves is the mighty world wave, a veritable realm of massive vibrations which can only be tapped by a coming into harmony with them, right? So that's what it's saying, essentially. There, there are some energies out there, right, behind thoughts, behind everything there is energy. And so if you want to move towards a thing, you want to be a thing, you want to have a thing, all you have to do is, is to vibrate on the same frequency as the same thing. You know, even Nikola Tesla said everything is energy. All you have to do is be on the same frequency of what you want and you will have it. If we brought a mind alert to the fullest extent, intent on the question in hand, senses one pointed, five merged into one, with the mass forces of the mind, the consciousness would absorb the facts like a sponge taking up water. It is in this way that men like Edison, who have shut themselves in from intrusion, have successfully thought out perplexities and made the world richer for their labors. This just reminds me of Janine, because I'm 100%, 99% sure <laughs> that Janine read The Master Key, because she speaks about these concepts in her song Open Heart. She's telling you how she used concentration to change her reality to what she wanted, right? And how she did it with an open heart. Because you have to be, as the book said, you have to be open to these energies and these frequencies. Are you going to stay stuck? You can't grow. You can't evolve. You can't realize your power if you are close to these ideas. Janine also mentioned in the song how she had to close off everybody. She had to isolate. She had to block off people. And so this is what I'm talking about when I say you have to put up boundaries. You know, mind control is not about putting a lock on your mind. It's about creating boundaries so that Nothing comes in that you don't want and nothing goes out that you don't want. So in part one, he also speaks of claiming ownership of your thoughts, where your thoughts are yours. You don't copy anyone's thoughts or ideas. So you don't think of a thing because someone told you to think about it. Uh, this type of book creates free thinkers, individuals. You know, the type of people that they don't want in this type of society. They want people who are going to fall in line and think what they tell them to think and do what they tell them to think. And I don't think that there is any power in that. You know, you're mentally enslaved and I don't want to be enslaved in any kind of way, not mentally, not physically. Part two of the book now is all about scientific concentration all about concentration attention mental discipline and in this part it's all exercises 40 exercises for you to do and the exercises are essential right it no make no sense you go on to the other chapters until you do these exercises right and i would recommend that you pick out some of them and those are the ones that you continuously go back to. And the first exercise is one of those that I would recommend that you continuously go back to. But you won't understand or be able to apply the concepts of the next chapter if you don't deal with exercising your ability to concentrate first. That's one of the things I love about this book. These self-help books will tell you all of these grand things about how to change your life or, you know, how your life can be changed. But 
don't really share the tools or give you the practice. And the mind needs practice. The body needs practice as well. So I'm going to go through the first one with you. I'm going to take you through it. If you want, you can do it right now or you can skip it and come back to it when you have the time. But I recommend that you do it even if you don't buy the book. I recommend that you include this exercise into your mental training, your meditation, whatever it is that you do to affirm yourself, whatever it is that you do to elevate your mind and elevate your spirit, I recommend that you add it to it. Exercise number one, relaxing mind and body. The first essential in concentration is to still the senses, to get quiet, to suspend confused mental activity. In the past, in common with the vast majority of mortals, you have obeyed the dictates of your mind. You have never realized its ceaseless activity and enormous power. It is therefore the object of this exercise to introduce you to the threshold of your mind world. You must learn the hidden powers of your mind and then try to direct those powers. For the purpose of this exercise, you should select your bedroom where you are assured privacy. For you must be by yourself away from everyone. Lock your bedroom door and lay down on the bed. Lie in the middle of the bed, relax and stretch your feet down as far as they will go. Next, stretch your arms out and be sure your head is on a level with your body. That is not resting on a pillow. Raise your head and let it fall back on the bed as if your head did not belong to you. Do this three times and then let the head rest where it falls. Now raise one arm and let it fall in the same manner three times. Do the same to the other arm and then with each leg. Now lie perfectly still and try to think of no particular subject. Let the mind wander where it likes, but do not let it pursue a train of thought. The best plan is to think I am resting, just resting. That is all. After 15 minutes, rise. This is a most important, though very simple exercise. Its object is to steady the nerves, to quiet the mind, to relax the muscles, and to give you tone. Once you come to realize the peace and the good this exercise will bring you, you will value it accordingly and practice it when wearied or worried. You will find probably at first that all your body will rebel at the inactivity, but this will prove to you the necessity for the exercise. This exercise is the foundation of some very difficult exercises and should be carried out every day until it gives way to the exercises found thereon. In part three, he explores attention and the difference between attention and consciousness. You can be conscious of something without giving it attention, but it's a very different thing when you are conscious of something because you gave it attention. There is also a chapter on observation in part three, and it is one of my favorite chapters in the book. It's why I always boast that I see everything. You can't go around me. Nothing gets by me. No subliminals, no slights, no tricks. Through observation, you learn to see your environment in a different way where you notice all the details, but for your own use. For example, billboards. It's highly unlikely that billboards will affect me. I see all the messages, but I'm not moved. That is observation. Having an awareness of something, but you're not affected by it. Interest is the next chapter that I think a lot of people need to read because they don't know that you can develop interest in something. Although wanting something is interest, you need deeper interest to manifest it, and you definitely can create that. The next two chapters are on thought control and habits. You know, bad habits, good habits, 
using concentration to develop good habits or get rid of bad habits. You know, I've used this chapter myself to get rid of some bad habits. Part four of the book is vital because it introduces you to will culture. This has everything to do with your solar plexus, your willpower. This is how you create through an unbreakable desire for something. And this is a chapter I've returned to many times. It's helped me to manifest many things in my life. You will also learn how to apply concentration to things like public speaking, like what I'm doing now. The master key has helped me to be able to do these things. I'm not 100% in my confidence, but I get better over time and with practice and repetition. But sometimes doubt and fear does sneak in. And a lot of times it comes from social media. People project their own doubts and fears onto you. But again, this is why controlling your mind is important. You have to create boundaries that block out all of that. You will also explore concentration applied to personal magnetism. And that is important for people who want to be influencers. You want to be a leader. You want to be charismatic. You want people to be attracted to you. Personal magnetism is a really good chapter to explore. There is also concentration applied to health and disease. Very good for people who are battling terminal illnesses. Concentration applied during the period of gestation. This is a chapter I need to explore. <laughs> and the final chapters are on the secret of abundance and the art of getting rich. I really encourage you to get this book. I'm never without it. So I'm constantly a student of mental discipline. I go back to this book time and time again when I feel challenged mentally about anything in my life. It helps you to set a very good foundation for spiritual growth. Again, all is mental. So everything that will, you will do for your mental and spiritual elevation is going to start in your mind. If it's not the master key, then you can find another book that will help you with mental discipline. But again, you can reach out to iNation. I'm sure he's always with a book. Every time I look at his table, there is a master key book there. So you can definitely get it from him or order it online. Um, of course, his other works are powerful as well. But um, we'll talk about those in some other episodes. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Sacred Living Podcast. Please don't forget to rate and subscribe to the podcast. Also subscribe on our YouTube channel. And we'll link up next week at 7 p.m. right here. Bliss.